All right, good evening, um, everyone. Welcome to the tutorial this evening. We're going to start in earnest. And um, anyone who will join us could join us as we have just one hour for this tutorial. Um, we're going to be looking at the clinical guidelines for the management of traumatic brain injury. Guidelines for the management of traumatic brain injury as it concerns us in the ICU. All right, traumatic brain injury patients generally fall into two categories. Uh, they may be intubated and ventilated, maybe because of their low GCS and other associated injuries. And for this group of patients, they usually require full sedation, plus or minus muscle paralysis, ICP monitoring and management because you want to prevent um, intracranial hypertension. Uh, although the other group of patients uh, that fall into TBI are the non intubated self ventilating patients. These are patients whose uh, GCS ranges between 8 and 13, and uh, what you just require is post head injury observation and monitoring. All right, so um, in as much as uh, for those who are intubated and ventilated, they require full sedation, especially for the first 48 hours. You want to be careful because you do not want to over sedate. All right, or what we do in ICU, we do what we call sedation vacation. All right, to so allow regular neurological assessment, especially if the intracranial pressure is not being regularly monitored. All right, uh, a lot of times uh, before the patient comes to you in the ICU, the word have been seen by the anesthetist and the neurosurgical team. And uh, most of the times they're actually coming either from the OR or sometimes from the emergency room. So there's a need to take over the patient from the anesthetic team or the emergency care team. And one of the, these are some of the things you need to find out from them and document appropriately is the mechanism of injury. Was it a fall? Was it a motor vehicle accident? Was it, uh, you know, uh, what you call uh, maybe gunshot and all that? So you want to find out what is the mechanism of injury. You want to also find out the initial and post resuscitation GCS. All right, the pupils and any other lateralizing signs. You ought to find out also if there were episodes of hypotension or hypoxia and the duration of this sequelae. You ought to find out if it was easy or difficult for this patient to be intubated. And you want to have a detail about the management of this patient before being transferred to you in the ICU. You want to look at the Computer tomography findings of the patient, history of comorbidity, drugs and allergy, antibiotics and other medications this patient may be on. And last but not the least, you want to find out details about the patient and their relatives. This is important in IC because you want to regularly do family meeting and you want to know who to call in case of emergencies. So these are some of the uh, high points of your takeover from the anesthetic team um, you know, as you admit the patient to the ICU. All right, on admission, you want to quickly do your assessment in the ICU. All right, you want to quickly do your assessment. You want to look at the airway, what kind of endotracheal tube is used. All right, is it coughed, the length? And it's important also to document, like I told, uh, people working with me in the ICU and especially the nurses, we need to daily, on a daily basis, document uh, the length of your endotracheal tube, as this will help you to know and identify um, accidental endobronchial intubation or accidental extubation. It's terrible if uh, you're managing a patient and the patient was accidentally extubated uh, without you knowing. So. You need to assess the type of the, the tracheal tube, the length, and properly document 
you know, that says for breathing. All right, we follow the APC uh, line of management. You want to assess the breathing, the FiO2. All right, and I tell people it's not enough to just look at the uh, ABG or the um, arterial saturation of oxygen. You want to know at what FiO2 because a patient with uh, SpO2 97 at FiO2 of 0 0.6 is not the same as a patient with 97% of SpO2 at FiO2 of maybe 0 0.3. You want to document the tidal volume. You want to examine the chest for bilateral air entry and all that. Assess for circulation, heart rate, blood pressure. And you want to ensure that your MAP is greater than 90, especially because um, of the disruption of the blood brain barrier. And if the patient is an arterial line, you want to ensure that it's working, functional, and you want to flush to ensure that um, during transfer, uh, the arterial line has not gone out of place, or even if you're going to set an arterial line. It's actually recommended to set up an arterial line for this patient because you want to do bit by bit monitoring of their blood pressure. You want to check the pulpits, all right, the size of the pulpits, their reactivity to light and all that, and document them initially for baseline documentation purposes. You want to look at the temperature and monitor glucose level. Your target in all of this should always be SpO2 greater than 97. Your PIP should be at least five centimeters of water, and you want to maintain ETCO2 between 30 to 35. Some persons have actually um, you know, raised concerns about uh, allowing your ATCO2 to, to go as low as 30. So, but the idea is you want to maintain permissive hypocapnia and not um, uh, severe hypocapnia. Your MAP should be targeted at around 90 millimeters of mercury and above. Okay. On examination, you want to do a quick full examination, general and full systemic examination, the CNS, your cardiovascular system, your respiratory, abdomen, and pelvic. Don't forget that you need to also examine for all associated injuries. And this uh, calls to mind, you know, most likely a C-spine injury must have been ruled out at the emergency or even during uh, surgical intervention. But it's, it's still very proper for you as the ICU uh, physician to ensure that C-spine injury is ruled out and uh, the C-spine is adequately protected. You want to look for uh, chest and other abdominal injuries. Don't forget to examine the back of the patient, especially and including the scalp. All right. After you have stabilized your patient in the unit, you want to other for investigations, the baseline investigation vis-a-vis -vis complete uh, blood uh, cord picture with the clotting profile. You want to group and save blood. Um, your electrolytes and um, renal functions should be obtained. Infective markers, your CRP and procalcitonin. You want to con do continuous ECG monitoring. In this patient, it's preferred you do a minimum of five lead ECG and if possible, a 12 lead. You want to obtain cardiac enzymes and echo as may be indicated for this patient. All right. For arterial blood gas, you want to target a PaO2 of at least 97 millimeters of mercury and PaCO2 of 33 to 35. And the hemoglobin concentration should be at least more than 10 grams per deal. Yeah, like I mentioned before, for all patients, no matter the pathology, you want to always hug your patient, all right? So fluid and feeding, all right? You want to ensure a routine maintenance, resuscitation, in cases of, uh, um, you know, depleted uh, circulatory volume. Yeah, you want to replace ongoing losses. So the three hours of your fluid must be um, adequately looked after. Uh, normal saline is fluid of choice. There have been debate on the type of fluid. Well, for traumatic brain injury, normal saline, that is 0.9% uh, isotonic saline, and uh, still remains um, a good choice. Uh, plasma light B and um, 
bring us lighted, especially if the patient is not diabetic, or are also useful, but ensure that you avoid albumin in all of this. Crystalloid is the better. All right, target euphoremia at all times and make sure that your target serum sodium is above 140, but not uh, uh, above 150. You want to target your hemoglobin at between nine to 10 grams per day. All right, so um, in case of um, head injury patient, we do not do restrictive uh, blood transfusion. Most of the times in ICU, um, for patients who have been chronically ill in the ICU, we allow HBO between seven and eight, all right, especially if there are no evidence of ongoing blood loss, because at that hemoglobin, it is said that um, the oxygen extraction ratio is at the maximum, all right, and you also want to avoid the sequelae of blood transfusion. Early enteral feeding is, is uh, recommended for this patient, and you want to insert your nasogastric tube if you have ruled out uh, based on skull fracture, or I prefer orogastric tube because uh, for patients who will be on enteral feeding for a long time, orogastric tube is better tolerated with less complications. Uh, don't just give uh, feeding empirically, you want to calculate your calorie and protein requirements. Your calorie intake should be around 30 kilocalories per kg per, for 24 hours per day, that is per day. I always want to involve the dietitian early so that um, you know that the care of this patient is multidisciplinary and you want to involve the dietitians early. Give laxative because you don't want constipation and the different ones. Give laxatives or and you also add your prokinetics because this all aids um, enteral fluid toleration. Analgesia. Don't forget that um, um, the analgesia is very good. Good pain control is good for this patient as it uh, reduces the sequelae of um, uh, you know, stress response to injury and to, to surgery. So start morphine at five to 10 milligrams per hour for patients who are less than 60 years of age. And for patients who are above 60, you want to give lower doses at two to five milligrams per hour. Paracetamol comes handy as an analgesic and as antipyretics. Sedation is important to this patient. You want to, I, I, I normally give fentanimidazolam combination at one microgram per kg per hour and 0.05 milligram per kg per hour, respectively. Some persons um, um, use propofol infusion be, between two milligram per kg to four milligram per kg per hour but do not exceed four milligrams per kg per hour. And most of, this, most of the time, some of these patients may have some seizure or uh, convulsive episodes. Um, the literature is not too clear, but um, a lot of times people give prophylaxis anticonvulsants, but uh, some studies have shown that there's no um, better outcome for patients who have um, this um, prophylaxis. You want to commence anticonvulsant once seizure occurs, and uh, I, I said um, put the patient in a bag. Your first line of management for seizure control is benzodiazepine, all right, if it occurs, and you want to give your phenytoin, or sodium vaporate, uh, phenytoin is better um, advocated with a loading dose of one gram in 100 ml of normal saline over one hour, all right? And this is followed by 300 milligram IV or, or via your NG to daily for seven days, all right? And if all this phase, you just uh, take over the patient and you induce general anesthesia. Tombow prophylaxis, we're still talking about hugging the patient, your tombow uh, elastic deterrent stockings, or your compression stockings, and it must be above knee, all right? Not just below knee, above knee compression stockings is important. And you want to ensure temperature control, all right? Hypothermia is not good for this patient. You want to maintain a core temperature of between 37 plus or minus 0.5 degrees Celsius. And um, regular antipyretics, like, like paracetamol, 
and uh, there has been some controversies about NSAID, you know, in terms of uh, bleeding, in terms of uh, renal compromise. But a lot of times when your patients are adequately fluid resuscitated, the risk of uh, acute kidney injury becomes uh, minimal. External cooling and roll out and treat infection promptly. All right, head of bed elevation, like I mentioned before, and you want to ensure also prophylaxis. All right, just remember that um, when you're doing head of bed elevation, you want to know the patient at least at 30 degree head of that semi out position. And you want to ensure that the head and the neck of the patient are in alignment. Know that it ensure that when you're doing this, your endotracheal tube is secure, but not constricting the neck, therefore reducing venous return. Also, prophylaxis is actually achieved with your early enteral feeding, and you can then obviously add your proton pump inhibitors or your ischemic tube blockers. Okay. Now, so let's come to ICU management problem of TBI patients. Note that the management goal of traumatic brain injury is to prevent secondary brain injuries. All right, for traumatic brain injury, the primary injury has occurred, but you want to prevent uh, secondary brain injuries, and these include uh, hypotension. Uh, hypercapnia, hypo, hypertension, you want to prevent hypo or hyperglycemia, and you want to prevent hypertemia. These are the secondary brain injuries that you want to uh, prevent. And uh, ICU management, I coined a mnemonic, I call head. So head injury or traumatic brain injury, just remember head as follows. The first H, the first one H there is avoid the H you know, like the avoid hypotension, hyposia, hypo, hyperglycemia, and hypertemia. So you want to avoid all the H's. All right, that's the first H there. So anytime you have a head injured patient or traumatic brain injured patient, just remember head and you won't go wrong. So the first H there is you want to avoid the hypotension. All right, hypotension, you know, especially when you remember that the bubbling barrier has been um, uh, disrupted. Therefore, cerebral perfusion pressure uh, will need to be augmented to ensure that you don't have a ischemic or uh, infant injury to the brain. So maintain your mean arterial pressure at greater than 90 millimeters of mercury and, and your systolic blood pressure above 100 millimeters of mercury at all times. And this you can do by aggressive fluid administration under the guidance of your CVP monitoring. All right, adequate fluid volume resuscitation at all times. All right, if patient remain hypotensive despite your adequate fluid resuscitation, you may want to employ vasopressors inotrope to defend your MAP. Um, remember that your noadrenaline should be given be a central line being a vasoactive agent. All right. And it depends on what you're doing. All right, once you're getting as high as 10 mil per hour of your noadrenaline, it's time for you to start hydrocortisone at 100 milligram IV TDS. The second H you want to prevent is hypoxia. You want to prevent hypoxia. You know, the brain cannot tolerate hypoxia. And therefore you want to maintain your SpO2 greater than 95% and your PO2 greater than 75 milliliters of mercury. And how do you ensure adequate oxygenation? You either do it by mechanically ventilating this patient with appropriate ventilator setting and regular APG measurements. I tell people who work with me, before you put a patient on ventilator, you need to obtain your baseline ABG. And every time you change a ventilator setting, obtain an arterial blood gas, all right? In head injury patient, you want to do what we call protective ventilation, and which includes low tidal volume and moderate PEEP, all right? A lot of times it's better to start with pressure control ventilation as volume control ventilation has a lot of uh, problems because um, with uh, volume control, 
you can have uh, precipitous increases in your peak airway pressure. Avoid hypothermia at all times. May ensure that you maintain your uh, core temperature below 37.5 degrees Celsius. And you can do this with active cooling, uh, paracetamol, and all that. Uh, people have, there are some authors have, um, you know, come up with a lot of uh, debate as to do we induce moderate uh, systemic hypothermia or do we just maintain homothermia? Well, um, some of these studies have not shown any clear evidence of superiority of one over the other, but um, in my practice and my experience, uh, maintaining homothermia uh, has, um, you know, been um, associated with some good uh, outcome. The idea is you want to prevent hypothermia by all means. Inducing hypothermia could have a um, good effect on your reducing your cerebral metabolic rate and oxygen demand. But don't forget that hypothermia has a lot of its problems like coagulopathy. And in, in, in patient in ICU, you don't want uh, coagulopathy with uh, VT uh, events. So the, the debate goes on, but as long as you do not have um, hypothermia, I think your brain will be good. Avoid hypogly hyperglycemia. Actually, both hyper and hypoglycemia are detrimental to the injured brain. But ensure that your uh, maintain your blood sugar, all right, between eight to 10 millimole per liter, all right, at all times. All right, end of bed elevation, we mentioned this before, all right, that's the E, and the adequate sedation is important. It may say that do not wake up uh, your patient, especially to multiple brain injury in the first 48 hours, all right? The, whatever the choice of your sedation, but make sure that your patient is adequately sedated. I've noticed, observed from experience that if you have adequate sedation, uh, you really do not need um, muscle paralysis for this patient. The vein thrombosis uh, prophylaxis, all right, uh, a lot of times we achieve this with uh, no pharmacological means with your compression stockings. And sometimes, preferably after 72 hours, of intracranial hemorrhage or craniotomy, you may want to start pharmacological method if you realize that your non pharmacological method may not be enough. But between uh, within 72 hours, I'm weary about using um, low dose, uh, low molecular weight her brain as a means of achieving uh, different trouble prophylaxis. Sometimes people have argued that if you use prophylactic doses, you may not have um, increased risk of bleeding, but if I can achieve um, my aim with my test talking, I actually we don't want to give a pharmacological method within the first 72 hours of a traumatic brain injury. All right, the, the D is their drugs, prophylactic broad spectrum antibiotics. All right, a lot of times um, you want to give antibiotics early, to avoid sepsis and hit hard. Anti-seizure therapy like phenytoin at five milligrams per kg per hour, like we mentioned before, you want to load phenytoin, all right, you know, and uh, have one gram IV, then you want to give 300 milligram IV per day, all right. A lot of time people have said that, do we use prophylactic or not? But whatever it is, it's important for you so I have a high index of suspicion as it concerns um, seizure activities in the brain in your patient. All right, monitoring. Um, this most of the time would have been done, but sometimes, all you know, right, in why not in the patient in ICU, you, you want to obtain the CT scanning again to ensure that there's no edema and there's no increase in intracranial pressure. All right, the most important role of CT scanning in the head injury patient is the prompt detection of mass lesions, all right, such as extradura or sodura hematoma with pressure uh, effect and all that. Cerebral geography should be considered when uh, you're suspecting vascular injury, such as 
carotid artery dissection in head injury operation. All right, uh, we said that ICP monitor is very important and um, you want to ensure that you avoid intracranial hypertension. And I mentioned here that treatment of intracranial hypertension can, should, can also be summarized with the uh, acronym HEAD. One of them is you want to, and this is different from uh, preventive hypertemia. In cases of refractory intracranial hypertension, you may want to induce what we call hypotemia, systemic hypotemia, to reduce cerebral blood volume and cerebral blood flow. All right. And another one is that you can do hyperventilation. All right. You want to target a PCO2 of between 30 to 35. Like I mentioned before, you want to avoid PCO2 less than 30. All right. Elevation of the head to promote venous drainage from the head, which um, will reduce ICP subsequently. Adequate analgesia and sedation. You don't want your patient to be off sedation in the first 48 hours, all right? You know, because it's been found out that it helps reduce ICP. Diuretics, your monitor hypertonic saline, 30% saline has been found to be useful. But don't forget that uh, manitor has its own side effects, which include intravascular dehydration, hypertension, pre-renal uremia, and hyperkalemia. All right, and the manitor also may cause what we call reverse osmotic shift or rebound effect, and with increased brain osmolality, all right, thereby increasing your intracranial pressure. Other drugs such as barbiturate has been found to be effective and uh, people have advocated for barbiturate coma in refractory intracranial hypertension. Mark my words for refractory uh, intracranial hypertension. In a small percentage of head injury patient, they may have refractory intracranial hypertension. And that's why sometimes you need to induce barbiturate coma and the, the regimen is actually given the uh, pentobarbital at 10 milligram per kg over 30 minutes. Then you give five milligram per kg per hour for three hours. And you follow this with your sodotal pentel at 2.5 to 10 milligram per kg, you know, per uh, IV. But remember that uh, one of the uh, uh, drawbacks of barbiturate coma is that you require intensive EEG monitoring, electroencephalogram monitoring. You know, if you don't have EEG monitoring, it, it is not advisable that you do uh, induced barbiturate coma. Sometimes you may do the, the compressive craniotomy if uh, the patient persistently continues to have persistent raised ICP in the ranges of uh, more than 20 millimeters of mercury in spite of your maximum medical management. So monitoring is important in head injured patients. And um, you know, clinical assessment, you want to do regular daily GCS um, examination, pupillary signs and motor re responses should be uh, assessed and recorded in your ICU chat. ICP monitoring is important in centers where you do have it. And uh, the gold standard is the use of intraventricular catheter, which has been found to be the most accurate and clinically useful method. Another advantage of this intraventricular catheter is that it does not require any calibration. And you can actually um, during CCM, especially in the management of uh, raised ICP. But the drawback is that it's However, technically difficult, and uh, we have increased incidence of infection, which you do not want. Measurements of the jugular but the uh, asymmetry, which is similar to your SpO2, all right, it provides useful uh, indirect assessment of cerebral perfusion. So your cerebral bulb um, asymmetry of less than 55% is suggestive of cerebral hypoperfusion, all right? 
But any value greater than 60 is suggested by paramia. All right, you want to also monitor your cerebral lactate flosses. All right, and an arterial jugular lactate difference of minus 0 0.4 millimole per liter or a lactate oxygen index greater than 0 0.08 is suggestive for cerebral ischemia or infarction. These are some of the monitorings that can be done. All right. Other ones are the near infrared spectrometry, spectroscopy, and transdoppler, which is a non invasive method of measuring your cerebral blood flow velocity and is useful, especially in cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage. You want to diagnose basal spasm, you want to use it to help quickly pick critical elevations of ICP with reduction of CCP. And this is important, especially. Um, in the ICU setting. And it can also be used uh, as a, a supplementary test for brain death, uh, or brain death uh, diagnosis. So for all patients who are hemodynamically unstable with a systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, you want to continue ICP monitoring. Patients with severe head injury, this year is of between three to eight over 15. Patients who are older than 40 years, patients who have the corticate of the cerebral posture. These are indications for uh, compulsory ICP monitoring. The gold standard, like I mentioned before, is using an intraventricular uh, ICP catheter. Okay, I mentioned barbiturate coma. I, before it's not something that is routinely done. And before you do that, you want to involve your consultant and the neurosurgical unit. All right, cerebral function monitor must be available before you start. And three amples of uh, tapento and 60 mils of water solution. And you can bolus this in 10 mil aliquot. You want to tidy three to four busts per minute on EEG monitor. All right, and you start your infusion of top of the between 10 to 12 minutes per, day, per hour. You want to reassess your EEG every five minutes. You can see why uh, EEG, presence of EEG is very important. And once you have achieved bus suspension, you want to gradually reduce the infusion rate of your top and top and stop midazolam and morphine infusion. There are a lot of complications that are associated with uh, barbiturate coma, okay? And uh, one of them is hypotension, which you can correct with fluid and the use of vasopressors. Um, so that hypertension suppresses immunity and that could predispose your patient to sepsis. All right, hypokalemia, you know, uh, usually occurs and this has been attributed to your ion, ion pump uh, inhibition. Don't forget the sodium tapens and so they have a high sodium content and may cause polyuria with normal urine osmolality. So you you could discontinue tapens infusion once ICP has been controlled for 24 hours, but you do not control you do not stop abruptly. You want to win slowly. Watch out for rebound hypercapnia as you uh, discontinue your sodium tapens. As you discontinue this. You're also restarting the dazzler and morphine infusion. All right. Um, if do we have any questions as we um, open the floor for discussion from your experience and uh, what has been your management of your traumatic brain injury as compared to what I have presented here? So if we have any contributions, questions. May we just, uh, the floor is open for us to make our contributions. I, 